Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Lisick. Uh, this is a continuation of kind of something we started in Austin and Barcelona, uh, just kind of our continued evolution of uh, AT&T challenges of dealing with uh, CICD uh, for our scaled deployments. And uh, I'm Andrew. This is Larry Rensing, and this is Malin that has joined me. So uh, next slide. Uh, our biggest challenge since uh, post-Barcelona is what we've been banging into people's heads is really a cultural transformation. That's uh, the people problem has been one of our biggest challenges of taking incredibly skilled DevOps engineers and uh, taking them back to thinking of a zero-touch cloud provisioning mindset uh, through the labs and through deployments, production deployments, uh, maintaining consistency. Back up. I'll bring the mic up. Okay. Uh, LCM, fuel life cycle management, these are some of the things we've introduced uh, for people that have been kind of following us. We are a fuel9.x shop uh, with the MOS distribution for the AIC 2.x reference architecture, which is a virtualized reference architecture. Uh, we host uh, two different kinds, or really three. It's kind of two different larges for specific VNF workloads, and then a medium uh, type of site deployment for a workload. Uh, which face it, which introduces a, a quite a few challenges from a delivery standpoint, but uh, what we've done is we've tried to drive consistency uh, through our pipelines and automate everything. Uh, our big challenges are greenfield, brownfield upgrades, that's a deployed site and upgrade it with things uh, like kernel upgrades or OpenStack component upgrades, version upgrades, things like that, the, the heavier weight things, contrail upgrades for a contrail 3.x shop too. Uh, and then we've done, uh, moved into a release candidate model to allow us to do sort of rapid patching within those sites using uh, Puppet and Fuel 9.x and uh, then our rapid patching, which is even a little bit lighter weight. We can turn those things around in like an hour out into production and control that through a canary, which we call SILs, our user acceptance sites, before our production application. Uh, to get assurance out there, then rack expansions or something else we needed to mechanize because uh, we need to grow compute nodes quite a bit. Uh, some of the other things we've touched on that have been really valuable to us have been able to, uh, certain components in our infrastructure that we deploy, uh, we automate the upstream syncing, uh, so it's just mechanized through Jenkins that we pull down. It's kind of, if you would think of a maintenance release, so we can kind of consistently get in and choose what things we want to cherry pick in our deployments more rapidly than waiting for the entire product to go, say, GA or something if we need a patch. Uh, and then the AVT emulated scale lab, one of the challenges we faced uh, in our deployments when we were using uh, the various products is once we got to three to 500 nodes, we would see some of the, some of the infrastructure show stress and would flex and so we, just to be able to do something consistently and rapidly, we introduced in this emulated scale lab. We can talk more about it if somebody wants to drop by afterwards. It's uh, literally just made of three Dell 730s and uh, with two of them having 150 emulated VMs and then one acting as a control node. It allows us to do some of those bulleted items there to kind of do some sanity uh, consistently kind of over our deployments and we can kind of observe times and you know alert when we start seeing things get out of whack if somebody's introduced some code that uh, introduces a scale problem we'll have some historical data to to flag so jump to the next slide uh, some of the stuff we were talking about was we look for consistency it's really really important to us so yaml describes our deployments uh, we use uh, a Jenkins mechanized node that we, actually it's just a slave node and we've containerized it and we use that exact same node from our, AV, from our basic, the farthest left CI CD labs, which we have dev labs, we have our RC labs, system test labs, and then up to SILs. We use the exact same tools, exact same processes uh, to make sure that we can sort of, what we do in these the same things is that we have a repeatable, consistent site. We tried in 2015 to deploy many, many sites uh, where we had a lot of DevOps ninjas having to uh, account for things, and we had to eliminate that as much as we could because we deployed, you know, 80 sites and uh, across the world, and you know, we're consistently deploying more of those. Uh, this year, I think we have another 60 on the books, uh, plus 60 total more this year. So. Maintaining that is a challenge, and consistency and automation is the only way to achieve that. So, 
Well, that's what we've introduced this uh, concept of full CD. Uh, and full CD is literally, like I said, just using Jenkins to mechanize the entire deployment procedure and all four of those items on bef that were listed before those different uh, levels of Jenkins automation in the pipelines and introducing our quality gates within those pipelines. They're almost all voting gates for us. So we do regular coding gates as well as deployment gates. So when we're actually deploying, uh, we can stop a deployment early in our labs before it goes anywhere if it fails. And we have uh, multiple dimensions of those tests that we're kind of always evolving. And uh, I think that's it for what we've achieved since then. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Andrew talked about gates, and uh, this, side will, this slide will give you an idea of uh, what gates we have in our uh, CICD uh, uh, and uh, deployment workflow. Uh, right from the point when someone merges a piece of code to the point where it hits uh, uh, that's at step one and to the point where it hits production, that's in step eight. So uh, uh, two to seven are all the gates that piece of code has to go through before even it gets uh, deployed in production, right? So we have some of the basic ones, like in two you can see the usual syntax checks, unit tests, uh, packaging. We don't also run some package checks too, just to be proactive to make sure it will be, the piece of code is gonna be deployed. Uh, successfully. Uh, we have our uh, nightly sonar cube uh, scans, which are the test coverage scans. Uh, we have uh, 45 uh, scans that we have uh, fully automated, uh, uh, which, which, which are basically security uh, scanning to find vulnerabilities in the code. Um, uh, step four, uh, we have the nightly uh, AVT. AVT is, a, we call it AIC verification test. It's uh, it's an integration test framework based on uh, Fuel DevOps and Fuel QA. Um, uh, once it's passed, and yes, we use we use uh, OSTF, which is OpenStack test framework, uh, and of, of course Tempest uh, uh, for our uh, automated verification. Uh, uh, step five, full CD. Andrew mentioned uh, full CD, which is uh, uh, which is also one of the gates. Um, uh, beyond that, these are uh, there is a there is a, something called a release candidate uh, integration lab, uh, where uh, uh, developers can uh, test their uh, piece of code in, a, in as it would be deployed in production. Um, uh, system test in step seven does their own uh, automated testing, um, and uh, that's I mean that's that's all it takes to hit production. So it's it's. Uh, it's a bunch of uh, stages that you have to pass until uh, until you can get there. Um, uh, here are some of the metrics that will give you an idea. I mean, Andrew mentioned we are in more than 80 plus uh, production sites, right, all over the world. Um, this give you an idea of the scale that we are operating at, right? And these are again, these are old numbers. Uh, highlighted some of one some with uh, some uh, important ones in the red. Uh, like we, with full CD, we are able to uh, deploy uh, in uh, eight hours. Uh, I think I will, I'll let you see. If I think we're running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Larry real quick. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's no secret at this point the uh, benefits that containers and things like Kubernetes provide. Uh, internally at AIC, we have an effort to containerize our local control plane, uh, leveraging the OpenStack Helm project and uh, using Helm to deploy our OpenStack control plane. Uh, the benefits, uh, this is pretty much common knowledge. Uh, Kubernetes provides that abstraction layer that sort of separates the hardware from the actual software running. It, you don't really have this uh, snowflake syndrome going on. Uh, so this is an example of our workflow. Uh, the top one is if a developer was going to make a modification to a project like uh, Keystone, if we push a bug fix, assuming it passes like the PEP8 unit test, we're going to perform a Docker build, uh, stand that container up, do some basic health checks to make sure it doesn't fall over on top of itself when you bring it up, and then uh, tear that down, pass that Docker image ID to another project called Armada, which is going to deploy that in a Helm chart. Uh, once we have our full OpenStack cloud up, we're going to run Tempest and uh, <clears throat> rally against that to get our integration test and benchmarking results. Uh, if that all goes well, we're going to tag that as a release candidate and then push that out. And then the uh, second pipeline beneath is 
if we were to make a modification to a Helm chart, so we would push that up, bring up a single node Kubernetes instance using something like kubeadmin, uh, package up our Helm chart, do a dry run to make sure there are no syntax errors, and uh, pretty much the same from there, deploy it again. Uh, if you want to contribute to OpenStack Helm or Armada, or the tools we talked about, uh, the GitHub links are there. If you want to hear more about OpenStack Helm, we have another session on Thursday that will be presented by Alan Meadows and Brandon Josa. The uh, information's there. So we'll be outside if you have any Q&A.